Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to the Sweetwater Minute. We are at GearFest 2014, and we are joined by Jason Hook from Five Finger Death Punch. Good morning. How are Thanks you? Thanks for coming in, man. My pleasure. Appreciate sure you being here. You're actually one of your free weekends during the summer when you're not playing a festival, when you're not doing a it was tour. Just, yeah, it was just a, a fluke, actually. We've been playing every single weekend doing festivals in and around the state, so mm -hmm. uh, this is like the only weekend I had off, and here I am. Oh, we appreciate you taking the time and coming out to see us. Thank you. Bringing your signature guitar. I want to talk about that with you when yeah. we get the... But uh, let, let's step back. You actually are from Toronto. Yeah. Originally. Canadian. Started playing about six years old? Uh, six years old. Yeah. Started playing about six years old. You did your research. Well, you know, I like to know what I'm talking about. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Six years old. I mean, I just, uh, I guess I started, I just wanted to be, I saw Kiss Records and I was like, that looks incredible and I just want to do that so bad. I think that had, you know, they had that effect on a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just begged my dad, please, can I have an electric guitar? And just like every other situation, they give, they, you know, have like a, a cheap acoustic guitar to start. And I'm like, Ugh! but anyway, I learned a couple things. And uh, then I wanted a drum kit and a bass guitar and kind of just, mm -hmm. I wanted to be the whole band. Right, right. But anyway, uh, stuck with the guitar. And Did you take lessons or did you teach yourself or how did you get into um, it? I took lessons, yeah. I took lessons on drums and guitar. I had a private teacher on guitar that would come to my house once a week and... It was just awesome. I was just having such a, a blast with it. You know, when you're a kid, you don't have to worry about anything, no bills or, you know. Uh, right. So, you know, you just do, I would get home from school and just play, 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 play. Mm -hmm. And that's how it all started. Right. Mm -hmm. So kind of like Eddie Van Halen, start on drums and then do the guitar Yeah, thing. true. And, and uh, I, I think that any time that I've known a guitar player that has some sort of background on a drum kit, they have an extra sense of rhythm, you know, like they're always thinking about where the beat falls and how to play in and around it, you know. Right, yeah. right, yeah, it definitely translates into playing, I think, the rhythmic aspect. Oh, yeah. Right, right. So one of your first successful bands, Monkey Head. Wow. Tell us about that. You're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's impressive. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, the first band that I got into in Canada, um, you know, we worked very hard, we were writing songs, we didn't know what we were doing, we were very young, mm -hmm. but we were just beating the club circuit up and we would play half of, you know, half cover songs and then half our own material. and. You know, eventually we got into studio, made some demos, got the attention of uh, Elektra Records in uh, New York, and um, recorded the album. And uh, well, we got signed, and then we recorded the album in Los Angeles, and then that kind of fizzled out, and the, we got dropped. And then I took those recordings, and years later licensed them to a, a, uh, a European label mm -hmm. under the name Monkey Head. Okay, that's what those are. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So, so did you stay in L.A. then or did you move to L.A. later? Well, it was right uh, right after that band got dropped from Electra. was somewhere in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty devastating. You know, as you're a young kid and everyone is so proud of you and so happy that you actually, you're, you're off and running. Right. That, uh, th that, I mean, it broke the band up. And it was after that happened that I decided, well, if I want to just take one more shot at this, mm -hmm. I've got to leave and go to L.A. Mm -hmm. no matter what it takes. And right. that's when I you know, that's when I just drove down in like a Dodge Colt, right? With two hundred bucks, it was nutty. You and your guitar, yeah. Right. And I read something where you had made a promise to yourself that you were going to do it by playing guitar, no matter what it took, no matter I love what you're playing. Right? It's like the yeah, it's incredible. <laughs> <clears throat> um, because well, you had some interesting musical kind of directions that you that you went in when after you got there. Well, you know the the only thing that I really believe that I'm good at is playing the guitar, and you know, it's the only th asset that I really have. So if I sort of you know, get into this field or start making a little bit of money doing computer work or whatever. It's not really why I made, you know, I didn't, I, I said, don't go there and get scooped up into some other thing. So right. I just said, uh, or waste time in some kind of day job. Right. You know, I said, I'm going to make sure that I'm playing guitar, even if it's $10 a day, that's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's what I did. Right. So you did some session work? Oh, I did play it on everybody's thing. Yeah. Right. Right. I was, you know, I used to say, look, because people would, you know, I'd be playing at a party or a barbecue or I'd be playing at a club gig or I'd come up and jam on jam night or I'd be, you know what I mean? So people would be like, hey, man, wh wh how much would it cost to get you to play on my demo? I'm mm -hmm. recording all this week. And, and, you know, we're talking like a demo, like a bedroom demo. Sure. And I'd be like, well, I'll tell you what. I'll just come and play on the demo. And if you like it, you pay me what you think is fair. Good if deal. you hate it, no harm, no foul. We're still friends. Sure. And I walk away. Sure. So I ended up like, there's this guy that plays for free. <laughs> no. <laughs> He's great. Yeah, right, yeah. right. So you ended up then playing with Bullet Boys? Oh, yeah. Did a little, little uh, stint with them a couple of years? Well, that was kind of my first real gig as far as, you know, I don't, Bullet Boys had some success in the late 
'90s. I mm -hmm. think their first record went gold, and it was '89 uh, with "Smooth Up in You" and and uh, um, "For the Love of Money," which was a cover mm -hmm. song. And uh, then they had a couple records after that. I always thought the band was really cool, very organic, and a four-piece kind of like raw, almost Guns N' Roses meets Van Halen type band. Right. Um, flash forward to when they asked me to join. Um, they just got a hold of me and, and there wasn't really a lot of money in it, but they had a bus and we were going on a tour of clubs and that was kind of my first experience on a real tour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, It was a lot of fun actually because I was the only guitar player and it was low pressure because it wasn't like we were going on to, uh, you know, the Letterman show or anything. It was just like these saloons, you know. Right. So right. it was cool. Right, a great learning experience. Yeah, oh yeah. You get, out and get a hey, tour under your belt. Every Every situation will teach you something, mm -hmm. you know? So every time I was in a situation, no matter how frustrating it was or how difficult it may have been, you're thinking, there's something I'm supposed to extract from this. Mm -hmm. So figure out what it is, and then, then you start to think, well, th there's a reason I'm here then. Right, you know? right, right. You went on from there, Mandy Moore? Oh, boy. Did some, some work with her? Yeah. Right? Well, actually, man, you know, that, that whole thing was great. I mean, it's, that sort of st sticks with the original idea of no matter what, I'm going to play my guitar and that's it. So people, right. you know, I started to meet more musicians and they would be like, there's an audition tomorrow. They're looking for an acoustic guitar player. Do you have an acoustic? Of course I have an acoustic. Of course I didn't have an acoustic. <laughs> but uh, I remember just getting the lead uh, to go to this audition and I went to the audition. I got the gig. Mm -hmm. So before you know it, so then now I sort of left the Bullet Boy situation and now we're off like touring all over the world doing mostly TV shows. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a weird thing. It was like back then it was uh, TRL, MTV, Beach House, all these kind of like the view morning show type appearances. And I'm just up there playing, you know, some of them with just me and her. Right. So that was some pressure there, you know. Yeah, but, yeah no doubt. But I loved it. I loved it. I was happy because it was, st I was sticking with the plan and the plan was working. And that, to me, was success. Sure. You know, yeah, instead, of, instead of like lifting pallets at Home Depot on a forklift going, God, I should have taken that gig, you know? Right. So, right. From there, Alice Cooper, Vince Neil. Yeah. Some sessions and yeah. uh, some, some playing with those guys. All kinds of stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, there was, a, there was a couple other pop gigs that we can skip over. <laughs> um, well, just because, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't hide anything, and uh, I had a great time doing all that stuff, but I would prefer that people know me as the guy now who's in Death Punch, which is where, where my heart is, you know? Yeah, of course. I mean, I'm kind of a hyper, and I like to... Right, you know. right. What I thought was interesting is that you had an early connection, though, there, because your first uh, solo album, uh, uh, Safety Dunce, had the... Uh, Jeremy Spencer, right, was the drummer. Yes. On that. And He's Jeremy Spencer's the drummer yeah. in, in a Five Finger Death Punch. The, uh, well, see, Jeremy and I have been friends. Um, he was one of the first musicians that we, but I became friends with in Los Angeles. And um, he's an incredibly talented and hardworking guy. Hmm. And we just clicked. And I remember thinking that whatever I do, I want to do it with this guy. Because he's very fiery and very high energy, exciting. It, it, so it, I had kind of my Alex Van Halen type you know right and um and uh, i tried to pull jeremy into all these gigs i had and then he was like i don't know man you know bullet boys and then, you know all this stuff but um i started playing with vince neal so i'll tie this into the timeline but when i started playing with vince neal i was trying to get vince to do a record i like i got this great drummer and i can write all the music and vince was like oh yeah cool man that's cool you know <laughs> but i could never nail vince down to get any work done you mm -hmm. know and uh, so Jeremy and I ended up having all this music that we were working on recording. Um, and I said, you know what, let's just turn it into an instrumental record. And I'll just do a bunch of leads over it and we'll look at it like that. So that um, Safety Duns essentially started off being what was, we were trying to make a solo record for Vince. Mm -hmm. So it ended up being a, a great thing for you. It ended up being my record. Yeah. So, <laughs> and then you had that tie-in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then you had that tie-in with uh, Five Finger Death Punch well, yeah, because he well, became the drummer there. Well, that's right because you know, uh, when I got the Cooper gig, um, Jeremy and I didn't know what we were going to do with it. What do you do? With it? We made an instrumental record, and what do you do with that? You mm -hmm. know, um, it's, it's a long way away from being a band, from being a, a, a signed act or whatever. So I took another gig, and, I, and he was like, well, if you're going to go do Alice Cooper, I'm just going to look for a heavy metal band. I like to play metal. I want to play my double bass. I don't care if it makes money. I just want to, I got to have fun. I, you know, it's what I really want to do. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. So he answers an ad. Uh, in one of the LA trades, 
and it ends up being Zoltan, the other guitar player from Death Punch, is looking for a drummer. So those two start writing songs together, and I would come off tour from Cooper, and he'd be like, dude, I found this guitar player. He's like this heavy rhythm guy, and I'd be like, let me check it out. And, and I was listening to it going, I'm supposed to be your guitar player. <laughs> right. This is all bad. Right. But right. the net net is, it got signed, and I got into it sort of at the last minute. It was a really lucky thing for me. Right. Because right. it almost missed, you know, almost passed me by, and it would have been, you know, devastating. Yeah, no, it worked out, uh, yeah, worked worked out, out well, obviously. So albums since then, world tours, oh, videos, yeah. lots well, of great stuff going on. I can't complain. Yeah? Uh, you know, we work very hard. Um, we don't mess around as far as, you know, you know, we're a little older. The whole party lifestyle is not important to us. We kind of want to... We want to be good at what we do, and we want to f be focused, and you know, we don't want to, we don't want it to go away. That's mm -hmm. the that's the biggest fear is like, let's not screw this up because you watch so many bands that do screw it up, you mm -hmm. know, um, and it's and we're not delusional. We know that there's a window of popularity, or there's a window where the band has that buzz, and then it kind of subsides, and then people kind of go, what's next, you know? Right. So, you know, we our curve of popularity or success has been pretty, you know, steep. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we, we're, we're doing an album every 18 months. I'm, awesome. I'm writing music on the road so that with the second we get off the road, maybe we'll take a week off, and then boom, we're Back tracking. Yeah. yeah, and I, so we're just, uh, I was talking to Jim this morning, we're building a studio at my house. I have a little anxiety because the accountants keep calling and telling me, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> 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 um, but, uh, so, you know, ha most of the stuff that I do for the band, I do at my place, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I just send over the files. Right. And why do you choose to do that? Um, because I don't, uh, you know, I'm an artist. If I want to work at four in the morning and, uh, or I don't feel like working on a schedule, I, I want to be able to do it at my pace. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm super picky, super picky about everything I do. So if it's not right, I'll do it a hundred times until it's right. I mean, records are forever. Okay. Right. Right. Like, I'll die. They will stay. Right. So there's nothing that is more important than what, how much time it takes for this to be right for me is what it takes. Mm -hmm. And if I have to spend every dime of my money to make it right at my house, that's fine, too. Sure. It's sure. important to me. Right. But, you know, that's, I, think that's where, I think that's why people have paid attention to our records, because it takes everything we got. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... A couple of the hallmarks of your style that I noticed in, in going kind of through things is, first of all, you have a real melodic thrust to everything that you do. Melodic thrust? A melodic thrust, I yes, like exactly. That. There you go. That's a new trademark term you can use. I was going to say, is that, is that available? Dot com? <laughs> <laughs> melodic thrust dot com. Is that, is that something you took from your influences, or what, what drives you in that direction, as opposed to just playing licks or well, trying to be flashy? To, to, um, I never liked guitar players. I know it sounds, well, I shouldn't say that entirely. I never liked guitar players that were just guitar, like, guys that were trying to impress you. Mm -hmm. I like guitar players that were in great bands, you know? Um, like Neil Sean from Journey, we talk about melody. Mm -hmm. You know, people are like, what do you mean? Okay, let me get this straight. The guy from Death Punch likes Journey? Well, l let's go back a little bit. You know, it's like every, everything is a song, and songs impact people, lyrics, melody, rhythms, all that stuff. And the people that are very good at writing songs are the ones that really touch the nerve touch a lot of people. Mm -hmm. That's all I want. You call it metal, hard rock, whatever, cool this, it's not cool that, but it, does it touch the nerve? That's right. all I want. Right. And so the bands that touch the nerve are the bands that are these massive, legendary bands, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Journey, love them or hate them, um, they had some incredible, timeless songs, mm -hmm. melodies that will go on forever. Sure. And, and I just thought that Neil was one of those guys that could milk a note, you know, he would just be like, right, you know, it's a Stein, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it's certainly that kind of, and, and, and songs, right, it's always inside of great songs, and and certainly, uh, you know, I'm a big Ace Freely fan, and Kiss, and, uh, you know, Love Em or Hate Em, this is a huge band that touched millions of people, and uh, certainly resonated with me, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Ace had a very simplistic, Everything had a middle, uh, beginning, a middle, and end, you know, and very rhythmical, and it wasn't too complicated. It was very easy to absorb, and you could sing it back, and right. I like that. I appreciate that. Right. And, you know, as flashy as I, the, the only flash that I appreciated was, uh, like, Eddie Van Halen, because he could still, 
he could still bend and it was very freestyle right but it was he had flash see but right. that you know to me that's that was everything yeah and great songs sure you know sure 1984 sold 18 million copies that's a few records 18 million copies <laughs> if we go gold we're like kissing the ground going go god <laughs> right Another thing that I noticed is your use of guitar harmonies. Yeah. You'll do a little, uh, like, like almost interludes mm -hmm. that are harmony guitars, but what I found even more interesting than that is the way that you'll kind of tuck harmonies behind some of your leads and things. Can you talk a little bit about that, the, the arranging aspect? You're of so being... good, dude. Oh, well. You're good. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, um, because I'm kind of a studio rat, and you realize, well, I got all these tracks. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, I... Um, and I'm doing it at my place, so mm -hmm. I always think like, well, this is really neat, and if I'm going to slow down and really sort of stamp out some kind of melodic section, what what would it sound like if I did an octave below? Mm -hmm. And what if I did a what if I did a third above or a fifth above or a fifth below, whatever? And, and then you go, ooh, ooh that's kind of neat, and then you really pull it right back down so that it's more felt instead of heard. Right. And then you get this like thick, you know, and, and people go, why, why does he sound like that? But I think it, it may actually end up being identifiable as my stamp. I think so. Because it always slows down and then there's like this big movement of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, when we play it live, some great effects out there now that... Can help you, help the, you achieve that? Yeah. I don't want to give away all my secrets, but the the, the uh, intelligent pitch shifter is certainly you can tell. Ooh, I'm in B minor, aliens. Go, okay, cool, and then plays all the parts that on the record for me. <laughs> right, right, right. Cool stuff. So you're you're jamming a little bit on your guitar. Tell us about this. This is the M4 Sherman Explorer, correct? This, yeah, this is the best guitar you can buy today. Awesome. <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. Uh, this is uh, you know, this is an achievement in itself. I mean, certainly, uh, you know, Gibson sort of being, in my opinion, anyway, the Rolls Royce brand of uh, you know, American-made guitars. The, um, every kid, I think, would love to have their own signature Gibson. That's a big deal. Right. So, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to um, be granted this great gift, and uh, this is this has basically uh, been modified, in my opinion, anyway, as a hot rod explorer. I mean, the explorer is kind of a classic mm -hmm. instrument, classic shape. This has been sort of modified for for speed demons. Right. Um, yeah. Anyway, so this this is the cutaway here that's kind of cool. So, you know, I would be playing up here and I would always bang into that body wood. So right. I said, let's get rid of that, Shh, scoop that out. Um, I like the comfort of having a, a bevel here just so that I'm not kind of coming over that for, uh, right angle. Mm -hmm. And um, this is the flux capacitor. We can't talk about that. No, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Got to have it too good. Right? No, I, you know, I, I like the graphic. I pulled the pick art off of the ones I did originally, and it would left this open channel here. So this is just, I was looking around the garage. I'm like, what can we stuff in there mm -hmm. to cover up the wires? And this was like some plastic. It uh, looks great. Yeah. Looks great. Yeah. So you've got a, a Duncan JB and a Duncan 59. Is yes, that right? Sir. In the, the pickups there, mini Grovers at the top. Uh, locking mini Grovers. Locking mini yep. Grovers. Uh -huh. I was like, do they make those in mini? And they're like, well, we'll have to look. So there you go. Yeah. And then my little uh, decal here. Nice. Nice. And it's all mahogany. You yeah. get a big, thick, rich sound out of it. It's the coolest guitar ever. That's uh, great. I, I love these. And uh, I mean, anyone who's playing one go, dude, that's incredible. The, the, probably the, the most notable feature is the, uh, these are super jumbo frets and they're flat, like they're very flat, very wide. Mm -hmm. You can slide around like real fast, you know, and you never, you know, nothing too high. Um, and I think the only other Gibson models that have this fret are maybe either uh, Zach Wilde for sure. Mm -hmm. His bullseye, Les Paul, and I think maybe Ace's Ace Freely's. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, it's, really it's a noticeable feel. Yeah. It's very fast. Yeah, because you can move this way, you know, mm -hmm. um, and not feel much crossing your fingers. You know, it's really right. smooth. Right. Nice. Nice. Jason, thanks so much for coming in. My pleasure. We appreciate you hanging Dude, out with you're us awesome. today. Oh, well, you are. Um, and thanks for coming for Gear Fest. Doing yeah. your, uh, you're going to be putting on a little show here uh, and That's uh, right. talking to the people and hanging out a little bit. So thanks a lot. My we pleasure. Really appreciate you being Thank here. You. I'm Mitch Gallagher. Thanks for joining me for the Sweetwater Minute.